Peace be out, family. I'm your host, Shabari Lamb, and this is another edition of the Liberian Presidential Series. And in this video, we'll be talking about the 11th Liberian President, Hillary R. W. Johnson. Before I begin, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. Make sure you comment down below, tell us what you think, and of course, sign up to the website at blafricstand.org slash register. So who was Hillary R. W. Johnson? Well, Hillary R. W. Johnson was the first Liberian president to be born on Liberian soil. All of the other previous presidents were born in the United States, Alfred Francis Russell in Kentucky, Anthony W. Gardner in Virginia, James Gilbert Smith in South Carolina. He's going to be the first Liberian president to be born on Liberian soil. And he was born to parents Elijah Johnson and Rachel Wright. And this is very important because Elijah Johnson was one of the founders of Liberia. He was one of the first African-American repatriates to leave in New York in February of 1820 to sail to then Freetown or Sierra Leone, around the Freetown area in Sierra Leone. And he's going to be the one that's also going to travel with the naval the naval leader Stockton to Liberia for the negotiations of the territory. Johnson's also going to serve, he also served as a member in the U.S. military, and he fought in the War of 1812, and he also established the Methodist Episcopal Church of Liberia. He is credited with defeating numerous indigenous factions in Liberia, particularly an example would be in 1822 with the situation with the day, but there's also a couple of earlier skirmishes with the Basa and the Bai. And Johnson also represented Montserrat County at the Constitutional Convention and was one of the signatories of the Declaration of Independence. Now, this is just his parents, particularly his father. We don't know too much about his mother, but this is his father. Now, he's going to have descendants that are going to do stuff, do work that is just as significant. So he's going to have a son by the name of Frederick Eugene Richelieu Johnson, also known as Frederick E.R. Johnson. He's going to serve as attorney and a chief justice serving from 1929 to 1933. He's also going to have another son by the name of Gabriel Johnson, and he's going to serve as mayor of Monrovia and is also going to be a member of the UNIA. And he's going to be one of those people who supports Garvey and, of course, believes in Garvey's vision and encourage African-Americans in the UNIA to begin setting up in Liberia. Despite all of this, th this, this great legacy before and afterwards, when he's growing up and he's dealing with his father, his father's not really well off. And this is happening when he's very young, but he's gonna attend school. He's gonna have the opportunity to attend school and he's gonna get his education. He's gonna work hard. And this is gonna pay off tremendously. When I tell you this man was educated, this man was skilled, this man was skilled. So just education alone. In 1847, he went to Alexander High School, Days of Hope in Monrovia, Liberia. In 1872, this man's gonna be conferred Master's of Arts degree by Liberia College. In 1882, he's going to be conferred Doctor of Law degree from Liberia College. He's also studied several languages. He played musical instruments such as the flute, the piano, the violin, and the guitar. So he played four instruments. He was a skilled engineer, a surveyor, and a successful farmer. And then he served role in government. He was President Roy's internal minister, he traveled with the president to Europe in 1870, and he participated in Northern Boundary discussion. So this man has the education, this man has the skill, and we ain't even talk about his career yet. But in his career, he's going to be private secretary to then President Stephen Allen Benson. In 1858, he's going to be principal of Baptist High School at Days Hope. He's going to be an 1859 editor of the Liberian Herald, which, by the way, was owned by a man by the name of Hillary T., who was a signer of the Declaration of Independence alongside his father after it had been originally part of the ACS, but then was given to Hillary T. He's going to serve as a member of the House of Representatives in 1862 and 1864. He's going to go back to the Liberian Herald again. And remember, in Liberia at this time, uh, term is two years. It's not four years, it's not six years, it's two years. So he's going to serve in 1864 as editor of the Liberian Herald. And then at the same time, he's going to be principal of the preparatory department of Liberia College. And then 1865 and then 1866 to 1867, he's going to be secretary of state. In 1867, he's going to be professor, professor of philosophy and Bell's letter and professor of mental and moral philosophy at Liberia College. So this man was in, important for Liberia College. In 1870, which Liberia College is today what we call the University of Liberia. So University of Liberia 
is what used to be called Liberia College. In 1870, he was Secretary of the Interior under EJ, like I said before. 1871, Secretary of State under the Provisional Government, because this is the time when EJ was overthrown. From 1872 to 1873, he was Secretary of State and Secretary of the Interior under then Joseph Jenkins Roberts, because Joseph Jenkins Roberts had been reelected. Then 1884 to 1892, he was President of Liberia, with his Vice President being James W. Thomas. And then last but not least, 1892, so we can assume his death, he was Postmaster General. So that's all the work that he did. Now, when we talk about his politics and getting into office, in 1884, he's going to be nominated by both Democrat by both Republicans and the True Whigs. Excuse me, not the Democrats. The Democrats don't exist in, in Liberia. It's the Republicans and the True Whigs. Get, get American politics sometimes confused, my bad. He's going to run unopposed in the election. And both the Republicans and the True Whigs supporting Hillary R. W. Johnson is going to mark the end of colorism. So per, earlier we've talked about the Republicans usually represented people who were mulattoes at the time that what they were called mulattoes, what we call mixed race, lighter skin, black people. The True Whigs represented the dark skin and the indigenous people. That's going to be brought to an end. And at this time. The Republicans are in decline. So when he's running for office, the two weeks have won for two straight times. Anthony W. Gardner and Alfred Francis Russell, which surprisingly sort of shows the blurriness of the whole colorism because Stephen Allen Benson and Daniel Basher Warner were dark skinned and Stephen Allen Benson was said to be a pure Negro. And then on the other hand, you got Alfred Francis Russell, who was 116th black and 1516th white, and then Anthony W. Gardner, who was mixed race, similar with Daniel Basher Warner, but he was light skinned. So it shows that there's some blurriness with that color, that colorism in that in in the divide between lighter skinned mixed race and darker skinned black people. So he's gonna run in 1884, and surprisingly, he's gonna run against Edward Wilmot Blyden. Edward Wilmot Blyden is considered by many to be one of the major pioneers of black nationalism and pan-Africanism. He's going to lose to Hillary R. W. Johnson, and Hillary R. W. Johnson is going to assume office from 1884 to 1892 with his president, of course, being James W. Thomas. So, when he's running for office, he was considered to be a true patriot, of course, like I said, being that he was the son of Elijah Johnson. But when he's running, when he's in office, he's dealing with the French, he's dealing with the British, he's dealing with the Germans. So the French are trying to take the territory in the Kabbalah River. The Germans are trying to take over some territory in the interior. And then, of course, there's Britain dealing with the Galenist territory. Now, remember, I've talked about this. The Galenist territory had been going on for decades. So this is an ongoing dispute that's happening. And, of course, in 1885, Johnson's finally going to formalize everything in paper. So originally, Alfred Francis Russell and Anthony W. Gardner had conceded the territory, but now it's going to be formally written. And he's going to sign the territory, basically giving the Galenas territory to the British crown. And that was done through the Havelock Draft Convention that finalized the border between Liberia and Sierra Leone. And this is going to be marked by the Mono River. So that's what's going on in terms of outside colonial powers, Germany, France, and England and then his successor is going to have to deal with even more drama because this is when the scramble for Africa kicks into high gear. So domestically he wants more schools and it's gonna include the indigenous indigenous Africans. It's gonna include the Pele, the Ba, the Basa, the Gola, all the indigenous people, ethnic groups that comprise indigenous Liberians. He's gonna organize clinics school improvement and encourage tribal leaders of the indigenous people ethnic groups to help in organizing more schools so he of course is integrating the ethnic groups together come together create one liberian identity and then he wants to beautify monrovia and encourages leaders to do the same especially the superintendents in their counties so that's what he's doing and of course he wants to move liberia college away from the capital in monrovia and one of the things that is remarkable about him is he's not going to seek a fifth term. So he was elected unopposed. Both parties wanted him. He ended up joining the True Whigs. 
which at that point, Hillary R. W. Johnson is going to basically show that the true Whigs are unopposed. They are now the official party. And he's not going to seek a fifth nomination. He's going to let Judge Joseph Cheeseman take over. So that's what you need to know about Hillary R. W. Johnson. And to really show that he cared about these issues and cared about the Liberian people and being a great statesman and leader the way he was, there were internal uprisings, particularly with the Gola and the Mendingo over trading routes in the region. And this is going on in the 1880s. That's going to last in the 1890s, all up to the 1890s. And with the Gola Mandingo War, there's even a Gola faction within that, their nation, the Gola people, and they were fighting each other over these trade routes and to a certain degree, slave labor. That, that, that's speculated. That's not, it may be, but at the same time, they were doing over trade routes and there were some practices of what we would consider slavery going on in that area at that time. Then, of course, you have indigenous people living in Montserrat County and further north continuing resistance and warfare. So they're still fighting. And then you have a situation where Hillary R. W. Johnson is asking for Grover Cleveland's assistance and he's not helping, despite the fact that Grover Cleveland himself said that the U.S. had moral right and duty of the United States to help Liberia. It must not be forgotten that the distant community is an offshoot of our own, but actions speak louder than words and he doesn't send enough support to deal with these internal uprisings. So this is all that's going on with Hillary R. W. Johnson in his term and he manages to work this out. So this is the 11th Liberian president, a truly remarkable man. And it just shows that despite him dealing with the tensions, the Gola Mandingo War and the trade routes and, and the power dynamics that's going on there, internal resistance that's going on, the colonialists trying to carve out the country, he's still trying to bring people together. He's still trying to address the issues and come with compromise. And that just shows what a true man Hillary R. W. Johnson was was in how he was able to transfer to his two sons, especially. So make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Make sure you sign up to the website, and I'll see you again in the next video. Peace, fam.